I am Vinny Totterich. Folks, your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed. Just like my guest, that's right, it's the Friday show. So there's no Anna Vocino today. There's no Gina grad. But we have a guy with a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge about pain. And I'm a guy with a lot of pain. Uh-huh. So we're going to learn something today, folks, without any further ado. Please welcome anesthesiologist and sports medicine fellow, Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. Thank you. They love you already, Jonathan. You can I see that. Right. <laughs> so, um, thank you for being on today. I, I can't thank you enough. And uh, likewise, you you have you know you you have a lot of studying under your belt, and you've done a lot of things. Um, I I'm going to tell you. I, I'm going to come right right in. I'm going to tell you why I wanted to, the one thing that got me into wanting to have you on this show. We can start here, and then we can go backwards from there. Sure. Um, the mention of ketamine um, when in the 1980s and 90s, I had a gay friend who was into all the drugs. Okay. He was into cocaine. He was into, um, God, what's the one that makes you feel love? Um, ecstasy, ecstasy or? Yeah. E, as they were calling it. Mm-hmm. And he came home like he was really strung out one time. And the next day he told me, he goes, oh, man, last night I did, I did Special K. Yep. And I was like, Special K? <laughs> he goes, yeah, Special K. They call it Special K. I said, so you ate some cereal? I mean, literally, I, I, I'm so square. I'm as square as a pool table and twice as green, right? And he was like, oh, no, this is ketamine. And I've been around horses my whole life. And I said, okay. wait a minute. <laughs> You're taking veterinarian drugs? And I th- and J- Jonathan, stop me if I'm wrong. You may know this. You may not. He goes, well, what you do? I- I'm remembering this from like 1989. Wow. 1990. He goes, what you do is you cook it down. With a microwave. Yeah. Was it with a mic? I didn't know that. I just yeah, they put it in a microwave and cook it down. Yep. You cook it down and it becomes like crystals. Yep. And he goes, and we we take those crystals and we scrape. You know, everyone that's on drugs should be running the country because they figure out shit that nobody else can figure out. Oh, they're innovative. Yeah, there's. Right. I I had no idea, and it's it's somebody who had done special K explained the process to me, and I hadn't read it anywhere else. Yeah. 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 And this way, he goes, we crystallize it, and then we take something and we scrape it into a powder, like we just scrape yep. it off into a powder, and then we just put it up our nose. Yep. And I was like, and you think that's okay? You're willing to do that? You're, you're willing to go bungee jumping and not checking to see if the bungee is on correctly or anything? You just, hey, they must have put oh, it in yeah. right. You know, if I was going to jump off of a bridge with – rubber bands hooked to me, I would check it 10 times personally myself and then decide not to do it Yeah, because that seems like, right? But they're jumping off of a bridge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I knew about ketamine. Now, this is where you come in, Jonathan. This is why I have you on the show today. Cut to two months ago. I'm talking to a buddy of mine about my age. He's, He's got a kid. Wonderful family, lovely kid. Kid's not on drugs or anything else, but the kid has some issues, right? Sure. As a lot of kids do today. And they decide, hey, there's ketamine. They could give this kid ketamine in low doses, like the word I learned, the new term, microdosing, ketamine, and it could break his depression or whatever it is. I don't want to get too deep into it because I know my buddy listens to the show and I'm hoping he hears this show. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call him and tell him to listen to it. Yeah. Where are we with 1989 gay guys doing this in New Orleans? 
scraping it out of a microwave and my buddy's kid getting microdoses. And how do they deliver this microdose? Yep. So just right up front, um, ketamine on the street, which is what your, your friend in 89 was doing, and ketamine in a clinic are two different animals, completely different. Sub, they're the same substance given completely different. You know, one obviously is snorted up the nose. You make it, you know, in your kitchen or whatever, or get it from some dealer where pharmaceutical grade, like I, you know, like I use in the operating room, um, you know, and you kind of got to go back quickly through the history of ketamine. You know, it actually was a buddy drug in Vietnam and it got fast tracked through the FDA because it was the ultimate anesthetic. It was a, it was originally found to, you can give a dose of it in the muscle and you could block somebody's pain, disassociate them uh, from their fracture or if they got shot or whatever, and you could get them back to safety without the need of oxygen. You know, where if you give somebody, say, morphine, you know, they're going to probably need oxygen or their respiratory rates. Ketamine doesn't affect your respiratory rate like that. Uh, and it also supports blood pressure in a little bit. So, so ketamine for the longest time was the anesthetic of choice for kids, actually. It was huge in pediatric anesthesia. Um, and it was huge. And then it became, before the other anesthetics came out, like propofol, it was, it was one of the go-to operating room drugs. So it's been in use since the 60s, really. And they knew even back then it was good for depression, but nobody had... But because of the whole psychedelic, you know, the, the, the Nixon administration and before that even kind of put the clamp down on studying any psychedelics and things like that, uh, you know, it really didn't resurface until almost the 2000s. And there's a lot in between there and it's in, it's in the book I wrote, but the revolutionary ketamine. But it's, it's they found out it first helped with eating disorders, the, some group in the UK, and they showed, you know, remember when bulimia was the big thing back then? And, you know, that was anorexia. 19. Uh, the first time I started hearing about bulimia was early 1990s, say exactly. 93. Yeah. So, yep. So they stopped, a, they were able to show in a group of adolescents who had extreme bulimia, they were able to abate or in a sense, treat this mental disorder. And then they also saw that their depressions got better. But not only that, they saw hints of like su suicidality decreased. And that's what got a lot of researchers attention. So there was a, a Yale group, doctors uh, John Crystal and Berman and colleagues started using it. And they did a pilot study, not knowing what to expect. And they gave it to a bunch of patients who are clinically suicidal and they found it stopped their suicidal ideations complete, you wow. know, like, like not just no drug. We, we don't have a drug like this. And, and so in the early two thousands, they did a bunch of testing and papers came out and lo and behold, it treats, it, it helps treat depression and it helps stop suicidality. No, we don't, I mean, you, you can give antidepressants and you got to wait four to six weeks for them to even work if they do. And then, of course, you have therapy. You always include therapy with all this. But anyway, point is it, to go back to your question, you know, like what's the difference between this drug given to, you know, say this young child, young, the young adolescent for his depression. It's done in a controlled environment with a controlled rate of infusion and a controlled dose with appropriate monitors and supervision and therapy given in and around it before it and after it, where the people bungee jumping through the K-hole has nothing to do with the proper use of clinically administered ketamine. That's what I like to tell people. They are two different, they are just two different species. Even okay. Though even though they're the same drug. Many questions already. Yep. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you, you mentioned um, SSRIs, so that you know you didn't use it by name, but I'm assuming you were talking about yep. SSRIs. Yep. And 
Correct. You do need to have a long period of that being in your system for it to work. And yep. I have friends that take SSRIs and it's changed their life. Right. Just yeah. it has. Oh, they work, you know, I mean, to yeah, a point. They, they do work, but, but you know, it doesn't, it's not a cure all. So we get that you just, you don't go to the clinic, you just start taking it. And before long, you start feeling better. And you know, some people feel so good, they think they can go off of it and they go off and they have a problem. <laughs> again and, uh. Or even more of a problem. And, and if they don't titrate off correctly, or try to do it with the doctor. So We'll get back. I want to get your, you seem to have a lot to say about that. So I'd like to hear it. But now you're saying that, okay, n now I need to know the mechanics. So you're not huffing it or you're not sniffing it, uh, yeah. you know, with a bunch of friends on Saturday night. How is it, how do, do they administer it? Do you have to stay in the hospital or in a clinic for any period of time? And then after you break your suicidal, your ideation ideation does it work for some period of time or do you have to keep doing this how to get give me the ins and outs of what they know about this drug okay so the and suicide the drug and suicide right right, right. yeah there's been um you know that's that's so i think the best way to answer that how you know there's many ways it helps suicide it's the there was a you know, the two, the main study of it um, was the NIH will will to live or will to die study. And they did it. Uh, the NIH actually did the study showing conclusively that the people who took the ketamine, again, given with therapy, proper therapy, it's so important to, to highlight that um, the 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 will to live group was so much higher uh, than they expected that, you know, it, uh, it, it just got, it just was obvious that it worked for that. And then, you know, and later on, there's been other studies like uh, Lori Calabrese out of, she's a psychiatrist out of Connecticut, uh, treated almost 300 suicide, suicidal patients of her in her clinic over some years. And she showed that 80 she stopped suicidality or suicidal ideations that that thought of I want to kill myself um, in about 80% of the patients and in about the other 20, it didn't stop their suicidal thoughts or ideations, but none of them went on to kill themselves. None of them needed to be admitted to say, say the hospital or Baker acted or, and then none of them went on to, to kill themselves. Um, and that's, you okay, know, so hey, hey, we, I, yeah. <laughs> I, we know that medicine, you know, she had a 100% success rate with this drug. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, not 80%. If, if 300 people did this and no one killed themselves, nope. that's, that's huge. You never, you, medicine does not try to get to a hundred percent. Right. But yeah. here we are with one study, one small study of 100%. Are there any other studies like that where someone yep. got similar? And can yes. you mention those? Yep, there's, I mean, John Crystal's done some of those studies, Berman, the Yale, um, the the Yale studies have all replicated that to some extent, you know, not, um, there's, you know, I did a, uh, I did a speak, a, a kind of a Ted talk on it actually. And I mentioned some of these, you know, some of these studies, um, the, you know, that they're, they're not all as clean as say the one I mentioned with Dr. Calabrese, but you know, they all have the same trend. They, they stop suicidality for some period of time. In some cases it was 24 hours. In some cases it was weeks. It depends on the person. I mean, you know, if, if, if a per, the ingredients for suicide are you're hopeless, you feel like you're a burden on society or the family, you're, <clears throat> you're isolated, and you have the means to take your own life and you're put into a vulnerable situation, which brings all those together, you know, <laughs> just go back to the lockdowns and that's what the, that's what that was. Right. So, and so you, you need certain ingredients 
to, to, to want to take your life and be successful at it. And what I, I like to say the ketamine experience does is change the hope equation. I don't think you can come out of a ketamine experience without some kind of change in hope, you know, cause it's like, it, it's like uh, other psychedelics like ayahuasca or MDMA or DMT or other things like that. When you, the experience involves you, you just, you, you do, you go outside of your head into some consciousness that's hard to explain, but it's, it's, you know, call it what you want, an oceanic feeling, you know, these feelings of like waves are all around you, but you just, you, you get it real, real, real quick that you are a speck of energy in this whole cosmos. And to think that your problem, you know, is so big. And then when you, then when you're put, you're almost kind of outside looking it, you're outside looking down at yourself or however it is. Um, you know, some people, and the other thing about it is, you know, you lose ego, you, you lose sense of your importance of your own self. And that's, those are all characteristics of a psychedelic experience. And that's what all these medicines can provide. And, you know, that's, so anybody who tells you they went through an ayahuasca treatment, that's kind of what they're describing. Um, and some of the same things, although not all exact happen with a ketamine treatment, uh, properly, do properly given, you know, properly dosed and, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, all right, I, I have, uh, I, I, again, you know, this is all, Yo, keep going. There's a guy, um, I, I met, uh, I went out with a couple of guys, you know, we, we did a guy night out. I don't know I moved to central Virginia. I don't know that many people here. Uh, I got invited out me and a couple of guys. And this one guy, uh, we, as a matter of fact, we swung by his house to pick him up. Guy lives in a beautiful home, very expensive cars outside. So obviously the guy's done well in his life. Yeah. And uh, we're sitting there and a uh, perfectly delightful guy. And I'm having a great conversation with him. And he told me he just got back from, I don't know, um, Chile or somewhere. And he had an ayahuasca retreat yeah. and experience. And I'm like, what, what the F are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is for, you know, you know, I don't know, hippy dippy people, you know, wear patchouli yeah. oil and hair under their arms, even if they're female. And uh, what are you doing? And the guy, and this, this broke my heart in ways I can't even begin to, to tell you. He goes, I lost my son a year ago in a freak accident. He was yeah. going to be a senior in high school. As a matter of fact, this other guy, his son, they were in the same class. That's how we know each other. And it broke my heart in ways. And he goes, I, I can't come to terms with my son's death. I'm having trouble coming to terms. Yep. And um, I said, did it help? And he goes, yeah, it did. It really did. And I think I'll be back again. I'm going to go back again. So my question is with the ayahuasca, and I don't want to get too far away from ketamine because we're not off of that subject yet. But this guy saw that it helped him enough that he's going back again. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Right. So how do you have to keep going back? Because I can't, I can't imagine losing a kid. Mm. Right. You, no, no one, I don't I think any parent can imagine that. So how do you deal with that? And do you have to keep going and doing this ayahuasca thing for the rest of your life? How does that work? I don't understand how drugs work. That depends. That depends on the individual. I think. I, I think it's it's a good question. You know, I'm. Do you have to keep doing this? In most cases, no. Uh, you know, usually with ketamine, anyway, most people need like three to six treatments max. Um, but you know, take some guy like Matthew Perry, for example, who you know is it's a good case to discuss. He, he was taking ketamine for years, like five or six years before his death. And why? He, he's quoted saying, he goes, I would rather deal, I, I prefer dealing with the near-death experience I had with ketamine than the thought of taking my life by suicide every month. Wow. 
what was do we know what his demons were was it a childhood problem because everyone who i was in hollywood for a lot of years i did not yeah. know matthew i knew a lot of people around matthew matter yeah. of fact, I, I trained the guy who created the show mm. right? you know mm -hmm. one, one of the three right kaufman crane one wow. of those three was well kevin bright was my client everyone loved this guy everyone i know loved this guy yeah why couldn't he love him? What was his, what was his, couldn't, yeah, he, whatever it was in his maternal life or something, he just had a lack of, you know, usually it's from the maternal side or sometimes, you know, the, you know, I, I don't know his childhood history, but this, so, usually when people don't love themselves, it stems from something like that, you know? Um, yeah. And then you cover that up with years of addiction which he certainly had, and he had several addictions. Um, and he just, you know, he went through I'm, his whole career addicted, you know, and, yeah. and sometimes, you know, you find that you don't maybe not act as well, you know, without being on these substances or not. And you just, or, or, or you, or you become in, in a sense, not you, your confidence is lost without it. And I think that happened, that must have happened to him, I would imagine. And uh, so as he was, you know, trying to, gosh, he did so many great things. I mean, he, he opened an addiction foundation, helped hundreds of people that I, you know, that, that I know of. And, um, you know, and I, 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 I wrote on my sub stack about Matthew Perry's death. And when I saw the court, the, the coroner's report, <clears throat> they, they kept saying that, it was all due to ketamine <clears throat> and it's true. He had a huge dose of the drug in, it, in his system at death, but he, but you got to understand he, he drowned in a pretty shallow jacuzzi. He also had some other drugs on board. He just got done playing pickleball a couple hours and the coroner report shows no, didn't show any IV lines or, you know, like somebody coming over to give him ketamine or, you know, and, and he knows how to give, get ketamine. He's been doing it for years and he has doctors, you know, that's kind of thing. And, and he had no muscle like shot marks that would have suggested he intramuscularly dosed himself or somebody else or whatever. Yet he had this huge, you know, he had a pretty good level of ketamine. And then and then it was found that, you know, they say it made him so euphoric that he drowned in the jacuzzi. Well, I can tell you, I've seen death many times, you know, in ERs and trauma. And you know, I'm, I know what happens. And people close to death get this what's called a hypoxemia or, or hypoxic survival reflex. And I don't care how high you are. When you're, when you're close to death and your lack of oxygen, you wake up. And it just, I was just like, really? He couldn't stick his head up above a foot of water, even when he, you know, somehow he knew he was going to die. So um, something else stuck out at me. And then the, and then sh also, sure enough, the coronary report showed that he had blockages in his heart. So did he have some, you know, heart? Did it trigger a heart attack at the same time? And that's why he couldn't respond, you know? Just a lot of it didn't make sense. And then and then on top of that, and you'll whoever whoever his assistant was or is or people around him took all the ketamine paraphernalia because when the police came, guess what? Zero there were zero drugs on premises except for those that he was prescribed, like the Xanax and the Puporphanin. Right. Right. And uh, and that was it. And so it's like you know, a lot of it was suspect and and um you know, and I talked to, you know, some of my friends in Hollywood who, who knew, knew what was going on and they all said kind of the same thing. And that's what, that's what sparked me to, to, to kind of write about it. And I said, you know, let's just think about this from another vantage point. And it got a lot of, it got a lot of attention. And, and, and I said, you know, I don't buy the whole ketamine overdose thing because it, you know, it doesn't stop you breathing. It does make right. you euphoric. But like I, like I said, it's, 
even at that dose, it, it, I, I think you would still be able to put your head above water. You know, maybe a deep pool I could understand, but this, I don't know, it was a jacuzzi and, you know, I'll get the, uh, I'll stop there, but you know, maybe you have, if you have, uh, you know, comments or questions on it. No, I just, you know, I, I feel sad. I, I don't, you know, so you don't think anything nefarious happened. You don't think anyone drowned him or anything else, but you just think he might've had a heart attack to go along with. With something. Yeah. 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 So that, it's look, it's sad all the way around. There's, there's no bringing him back. It's just sad that someone with all of that money that could get help. It just shows you that all the money yeah. in the world and all the help in the world will not stop you from, you know, dying if, you know, it, it's just very scary that right? no yeah. one is above it, right? So, yeah, it's upsetting. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit, okay, if we can. And I want to talk about how you feel about low-carb diets. I want to yeah. hear how you feel about being in ketosis. I live in ketosis and have yeah. done for ooh, a lot of years now, 17, 18 years. Yeah. Um, but before we do that, I need to tell the audience to go out right now and buy Villa Capelli olive oil. Villa Capelli. Look, if you're going to be in ketosis, we're getting ready to talk about that. Uh, you need to have the best olive oil on board. And that would be Villa Capelli. Listen, there are other great olive oils out there, but I can't go vet them all. People ask me all the time on X. They go, hey, man, uh, you know, Villa Capelli, but what else is out there? You know, okay, well, how, it's like, look. I can't go vet every olive oil. Can't do it. But the United States allows you to cut an olive oil up to 40% with any kind of seed oil and still call it 100% pure. So you'll see Bortoli's 100% pure olive oil. They've added um, a scent to it because seed oil smells like rancid oil. And they've added a color to it to make it look like olive oil again. You're not even close to olive oil yet on the package. It'll say 100% pure virgin olive oil. Not true with Villa Capelli. We know that this stuff comes out of Puglia, Italy. I vetted the company myself. I know. I used to know the owners. One of them died. Now I know the owner. I use this product in my vitamin D over at my company. So if you want the best olive oil on the planet, Go get Villa Capelli. You want to save 10%? Put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. 10% off every single time. Promo code Vinny. If you spend more than $125 after the discount, I've done the math. Spend $140 minus the discount. You'll be over $125. You'll get free shipping. Villa Capelli, let them know we sent you. Promo code Vinny. We're talking to Jonathan Edwards, um, I've learned more about uh, ketamine than I've ever wanted to know. Um, now we're going to go from ketamine to keto. It's odd that they both sound similar, right? Yeah, just a letter off. Yep. And, you know, look, Mary Newport, I, do you know Dr. Mary Newport at all? Uh, I listened to, I've seen her speak, but I've never, you know, I've never had the pleasure of meeting her, but I love her work. Yeah. Wonderful woman. She's been on this show, I, I don't want to say dozens of times, probably five or six times. She's in my latest documentary, Dirty Keto. Yep. Mary Newport turned her husband around. Her husband had dementia and used coconut oil and coconut oil alone, along with a, a low-carb diet, to reverse what was going on with him and kept him healthy for a lot longer than he should have been. Uh, where are you with keto and eating that way when it comes to mental, physical, the whole deal? Well, like, um, you know, as we were discussing, you know, I first got into ketogenic and keto, uh, the keto diet, so to speak, uh, through my residency in, in Utah with brain injury. We, we treated enormous amounts of ski head injuries, um, as you can imagine, you know, being in Utah. And, you know, we were using ketones in the IVs, um, you know, to abate some of the brain inflammation uh, that happened with some of these traumas. So I already knew from a brain inflammation standpoint, ketones were, you know, a treatment modality. And then, and then at that time, 
yeah, I really didn't think much about being on a ketogenic diet. It really wasn't a thing. What year um, was that, Jonathan, by the way? 2000. 2000, so way back when. you got, Were, were you guys using salts or esters? In, so, in the I believe they were ketone salts. Yeah. Okay. I, I remember, you, I'd have to, you, yeah. yeah. When you're going straight into the bloodstream, was it intramuscular or intravenous? Venous. So um, it, you're going through the vein and you're popping it right into the brain. So a salt would probably do just as well as an ester at that point because you, you don't have the stomach to contend with. Correct. You bypass okay. the liver, everything. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. I, I just wanted to figure out. So you guys were sticking this right into the bloodstream, getting it to the brain. And what did you see? Uh, I mean, th the results, you know, you saw some improvement in brain inflammation and some of the, the things we, you know, we measure, um, you know, like CRP and some other, you know, TNF alpha, those kinds of things. Um, at least that's what, you know, are in the studies. Uh, you know, there's more going on with an acute brain injury. So it's, you know, people are having seizures, they're, you know, they're having, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're sedated. And you, the, when the brain, a brain, an acute brain trauma is kind of like a heart attack, you got to calm down the muscle, um, in a sense, to uh, abate further damage. So to answer your question, you know, you don't really see much from the administration of the ketones right away. It would be months after, you know, like how the brain would heal. And then, and then the, this was the beginning. I mean, there weren't many research, there was some research around it, but I, I can tell you that this is the very early, you know, late nineties, two thousands that this was happening. So, <clears throat> um, you know, and the studies are out there if people want to find them. So, so, so the point, so the, question is, no, I don't think you're going to see much acutely right away. It's, you know, it's say, a, it'd be six months, year out, two years out, you know, I, and I think where you would continue the ketones somehow that you're going to see an improvement, say, if you didn't use them. Okay, so how would all right, so we, we know what ketones do yep. when we ingest them, right? So and we also know that we can make ketones from fats, right? We can, you know, we could, you know, we turn the fats into a beta hydrox. Yep. Yeah. So, and we know that we could do that a lot quicker if we take in medium chain triglycerides. You know, we all know the tricks, right? Everyone listening to this podcast know, knows the tricks. Is there any value to taking a ketone ester or a ketone salt? Yeah, if you don't do it, I mean, if you have a hard time doing it, that was the whole thing with Dr. Volick and Dr. Finney. They wanted to come up with a way to, you know, so people could, in a sense, not have to be so strict on the ketogenic diet and still be in ketosis. Um, you know, that that that's all still panning out in the studies of whether that's truly possible or not. Um, I don't. I, I think the best way is just to stick to the diet and be be natural about it. That's where you're going to get the most benefits. Um, you know, when it comes to things like cancer, though, things like brain traumas, depression, other mental disorders, um, weight loss. I, I think I, I think they have their place. Um, you know, I still. It's a, but again, it go. It's a supplement. It's not the medicine. It's not the diet. The diet is where you get your nutrition. You know, the diet is where you get your health from. You take supplements to to do just that. Supplement the diet that you're trying to stay healthy with. Right. And, and I and I see ketones kind of in that same. You know, like it's a supplement. You know, it doesn't take the place of a well. You know, a a well outlined lifestyle and you know and, and how you live around you know in a ketogenic diet yeah i feel you know people ask me all the time about the salts and the esters and i always say look if you're going to do one do the esters but good luck chugging that down because yeah it's not going to taste good and you may want to gag but you could get the same result by just being on a very low carb diet and adding in some medium chain triglycerides like a simple coconut oil. Yeah. You don't have to get refined 
MCT oils, which will give you the shits if you go a little too hard on those. Right. You can just have a little coconut oil a couple of times a day and literally end up in the same place. And I've had uh, 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 D'Agostino, he, he was one of the early guests on this show, probably he's been on more than anyone else. And he was one of the guys that was developing this stuff for the Navy, for the, you know, the Navy SEALs right. and the whole thing. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, you, you don't need to take the esters. Don't waste your money. Don't waste your time. Just eat a very low carb diet and up your medium chain triglycerides in the form of coconut oil. And you seem to be agreeing with that or am I putting words in your mouth? No, no, I completely agree with that. And I've talked to Dominic uh, about this as well. Um, you know, I think the the only place I might uh, not agree with it is say if you have cancer and you want to be, you know, in the your your glue and you want to get your glucose ketone exit uh, index to a certain point because you're de you know you're trying to battle the cancer. Mm -hmm. I, I I think supplements like salts and esters have a real place there, and I've I've I have had a couple experiences. Um, Amazing ones, uh, amazing stories, actually. Well, let me tell you my story, and maybe I should be taking esters right now. Um, I am coming, I'm on the backside of leukemia for the second time in my life. Mm -hmm. um, the first time was in 2007, and I beat it, no problem. And they told me it would be back in about five years. But somehow I made it 17 years, and back in early April of this year, I found out okay, your blood numbers are off enough. They, they did another bone marrow biopsy and found out, okay, yeah, you're, you know, we need to go nip this in the butt again. This time, chemo was a lot easier, even though they gave me exactly the same dose because I wasn't as sick, meaning mm. my blood numbers, I wasn't almost dead like I was back in 07. They caught it earlier. Uh, wow. um, I ate on point. I stayed in dietary ketosis. Um, I'm through all of the, you know, I took cladribine. That, that's the, you know, what they get for this. Yep. I'm on the backside of cladribine. They didn't give me, they took me off of all of the drugs that I, I haven't been on an antiviral or an antibiotic because it was causing hives all over my body. They gave it to me for a very short time. They took me off. My neutrophils are in a safe area. As a matter of fact, I have to fly again day after tomorrow. And the doctor just gave me, I have to go in every time before I fly because I'm not on an antiviral. And they check my neutrophils every time to make sure that I'm strong enough to fly. Mm -hmm. Meaning if I get COVID or the common cold or something, yep. I will die from it. Um, my question is, should I be taking ketone esters on top of that right now? Because I haven't been. Mm. I'm exercising again. My My... I don't know how I'm exercising, Jonathan, because my hematocrit level is only back up to 38. I'm a guy who enjoys 48, 49. I know that sounds crazy. Mine is always high. I'm at 38. That's the highest I've seen. My white blood cell count is still below the, the normal level, like in the danger zone. Yeah. My platelets have come back just a little bit. What it, and by the way, I've been taking B9, B6, B12, yeah, exogenously as much as I can, you know, just all of it, trying to get my red blood cells back, but nothing seems to be moving back very fast except the neutrophils. Is there anything I can do that you know of, including maybe being on ketone esters that might help? Well, the for leukemia that's a specific you know that's a specific deal and i mean when you when you brought it up i was like wow i don't think i've ever heard of uh ketogenic diet you know for the protection of acute leukemia patients and um and just when you said that i actually pulled up there was a 2023 study um you know already suggesting that metabolic ketosis is compatible with the induction of chemotherapy for at least AML patients. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, who would kind of know more than that is uh, you might know Thomas Seyf Seyfried. Tom's been on the show a couple of times. Yeah, he's, I've met him several times and he, he would be the go-to guy for that, you know, 
when you're talking about brain cancer, when you're talking about uh, bladder cancers and other kind of tissue type cancers, um, not to say, you know, blood is a tissue. Absolutely. Right. Uh, but, you know, you, you know what I mean? When you get solid, we'll say solid tumor, t- you know, tissues. Um, there's no doubt that having a good ketone index, as, you know, t- as Tom points out, you know, in his book, uh, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, uh, you know, and I, I have some incredible stories, you know, I mean, I have a, uh, I helped, um, a friend, you know, a good friend of mine who's passed now from glio, uh, astrocytoma, but, you know, we actually developed a ketone salt together and he subsisted on that for many years and it helped him. And he was strict, strict, strict keto, man. It was, uh, you know, a lot of, um, we, uh, we went through a lot together and then I had another herbologist who had bladder cancer and we used those salts that we made and he kept his ketosis always say, you know, above six, five, six. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they went back to go look for his uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer. And I was the anesthesia. I mean, I was right there. I watched the biopsy when he had it and I watched him try to biopsy six months later. You know, he, he of course refused all the, you know, they were going to take his bladder and all this. And so he, six months later, man, he, they went to go look for the lesion. It wasn't there. Couldn't find it. Well, look, yeah. I think I'm somewhat of a miracle because they told me five years. They said, look, you know, we're yeah. calling remission. In your, in your awesome. case, they said, we're calling remission, you know, the fact that you still have it somewhere in your blood. We just can't. We can, in your bone marrow, we just can't find it now because it's so low. We've kicked it back. But it's going to grow back. And the rate it grows back, you know, five, six years is what, you know, if you get five years, they said, consider that a win. Mm. 17 years and no one's questioning anything. It's like, as a matter of fact, I have. Oh, a- no. Nobody will question. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> so can, can I tell you what happened? My last doctor was a research scientist <clears throat> at Cedar sinai and, and she was the one that told me, she goes, when I was leaving her office the last time, she goes, uh, I said, hey, doc, is there any truth behind any of the drinking wheatgrass and all this stuff all my, my nut job clients are telling me? And she was like, no, nah, there's no science behind that. And she said, oh, aren't you the guy, because I'm, I was well known in Hollywood uh, as the no sugars, no grains guy, NSNG, right? Yeah, yeah. That's my, my thing. And she goes, aren't you the no sugars, no grains guy? You know, my friend was telling me that you work with celebrities. I went, yeah, that's what I do. And she goes, do you follow your own? advice and i said nah i'm a cyclist you know i i do these ultra cycling races and i need some sugars to get through these races and all things she goes well if you could cut out sugars and anything that causes sugar in your body like a grain or a potato you can probably keep yourself healthier for longer and i said well this is back in 07 i said doc what say you and she goes well you're going to start hearing about this it's not out there yet, but we're finding out that cancer feeds on sugar. Exactly what Thomas Seyfried says, right? Yep. You know, they, they take, it's a closed cell and, you know, it's a carbohydrate, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's pulling the oxygen to grow from the carbohydrate. And I was like, well, I can try that for a while. And the only time after that that I ever had sugar for that first year was when I was on the bike training. If yep. I was off the bike, I, I didn't have anything, and I was even able to sometimes be in ketosis like that. 17 years. I'm now with the doctor at UVA, great guy, and he made a comment. He goes, ah, oh, 17 years. You never see this. I said, interested in knowing what I did? He goes, nah, and we're good. <laughs> of course. Nah, I knew that was coming. Oh. Yeah, because I, I said yeah. to him, I said, no, no interest whatsoever. He goes, I don't want to hear it because – Everyone comes in with what they do and what they did. But you got to understand, Vinny, you're an N1 experiment. And I went, okay. It, but isn't that how it all starts? I mean, right. Robert Atkins had one patient that lost a shit ton of weight. And he said, what did you do? He read the letter on corpulence and he lost all the weight. And that's right. how Atkins started with N1 experiment. But no one's interested in, in, in my story of 17 years. I might have a record. 
I know a guy, yeah. you, you mentioned the word glioblastoma. I have a friend, matter of fact, a lot of people who listen to this show knows him. His name, his his stage name is Ball Brian. His uh, his name is uh, Brian Bishop. He was on the Adam Carolla show for years. He's the longest living person with a glioblastoma. And he's at like 13 or 14 years. Wow. You know, most That's people die in six impressive. months. Where, where his is located, six months. John, yeah, my friend John Mahoney, he was uh, should have died in three months, and he was alive over seven years for that. Yeah. By comparison, the same hospital that Ball Bryan goes to, or mm -hmm. you know, still goes to Cedar Sinai, my good friend, who was a titan in Hollywood, got the same glioblastoma. They gave him the same four to six months that Brian got. He gave a donation of $14 million to the cancer center at Cedar sinai to immediately put him on all of the drugs, all of the, you know, special, anything you got, throw it at me. But every time I went to his house, he was still eating dessert. He was still, eating oh. dessert. he was still drinking all of the stuff. And I said, you're doing all of the other things. He goes, listen, if $14 million isn't going to save me, I'm going to have Oreos. Okay. Wow. And by the way, three months, they gave him four to six months, three months. I went to his funeral. Love the guy. I still cry. He gave me a silver uh, loving cup one time, and I, wow. I still look at it and think of him. He's gone. Yeah. Right? Just, yeah, just, I don't care how much money. It's so simple. It's too simple, right? And, yeah. and it's sad. We're just coming to the research on this kind of stuff now, you know, and thanks to people like Safri, Dominic, um, you know, some, uh, you know, Finnick, Voli, all those guys. And, you know, it's all, yeah, it, it's, it's coming around for sure. Um, and, yeah, if I had cancer, you know, and, we, and you just got to live long enough and you will. You know, all humans get cancer at one point if you live yeah. long enough. And, yeah. um, you know, that's, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't see, you know, I was at Moffitt Cancer Center when I was uh, a resident there. And I'll never forget there, you know, because they tell you to gain all this weight before the chemotherapy for the breast cancer patients. And, and I, I met, uh, years later, I met a veterinarian. He was, you know, in the, um, you know, we were in Dominic's meeting, the Metabolic Health Summit. And, um, and, we, and he had the same story. The dietitians there tell you to eat as much cake as you can, to eat as many cookies as you can. Why? Because you have to gain that weight before the chemotherapy. Yeah. And, and you're just like, are you, you know, where in the hell does this come from? It's just like, it's the most, you know, excuse my French, you know, the, the effed up advice you could ever give anybody. And, you know, and his, you know, his wife didn't last long. And, and I know what many other patients like that, they don't last long. Um, and, and to be, yeah, it's just, you know, I think it's going to be considered malpractice one day to, to be so careless of a, a diet in the face of a, a lethal cancer. You know, I was in the infusion center every day getting this junk pumped into me. And um, you sit in this nice, comfortable chair. I would bring a computer so I can watch a television show, my wife would load in a television show for me or two. And because I have to be there for four hours a day. And um, they come in, they're super nice. It's like, hey, uh, anything you want to eat? It's like, what do you, what do you mean? We have sandwiches. We have, uh, we have this, we have that. Uh, any kind of cakes or candy you want, just let us know here. You know, we could get it from the vending machine for you. Um, and the first day I said, you have coffee? And they said, yes, we do. So they brought me a nasty cup of coffee in a styrofoam type cup. Oh, and uh, I only drank it because they poured it for me. <laughs> right. But the next day I showed up with my own thermos and my own porcelain. Yep. There was a stainless steel cup because it's like, wait a minute, you're trying to kill me with the styrofoam, you know, polystyrene. I, I don't need yep. that in my system. And this, your coffee tasted like crap, but Every day they can't. Would you like a sandwich? Would you like some this with that? And by the way, I can see around the curtain because I would have to get up. I'm 62. I would have to get up every hour to go pee. You know, so they yeah. unhook you and you pull the cancer. You pull the. You, uh, you, you hold it like a football. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, yeah, the, the, you're rolling the thing in with you, you know, <laughs> to, to go pee. So I'm walking by everyone else. Everyone else in that cancer center had a weight problem to some degree, and everyone else had food hanging out of their mouth, wrappers all around them. I get it. You're sitting there and you're bored. But isn't that the same boredom you get at home? Because they all brought a computer with them too. Yeah. Right? They were, you know, can you not just watch a program and that be enough? Do you have to have food going in your mouth while they're trying to kill something that's killing you? Right. It, it, but that's where we are. And yeah, I get it. Hey, would you like some cake? Would you like some Oreos? We got it all. Right. But no, that, that's not what they're doing. As a matter of fact, when I started bringing my own coffee in, Jonathan, they said, you know, you didn't have to bring your own coffee. We have coffee here. And I was like, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a coffee uh, snob. I just brought mine. I'm sorry. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was probably juice of sock water. That's what we call it in French. Jus de chaussette. <laughs> uh, as my grandfather used to call it, pipi lapin. <laughs> pipi lapin. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else. I think I just said rabbit piss. Um, no, the Italians say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, my my grandfather was Italian, but we grew up in French Louisiana, you know, south, yeah. down deep south. So everything was uh pipi le pain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, I want to switch gears again. Are you good to go for a while? Because I'm loving you, brother. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I got other podcasts to do, but I can't get enough of you. We might have to have round two with you, but uh, I want to say words I don't understand. Okay. Percutaneous hydromedy. That's hydrotomy. Did I say hydrotomy or hydromedy? Hydrotomy. Percutaneous. Did I get that part right? Percutaneously. Yeah, percutaneous. Yep. Percutaneous. Yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that's not French and that's not Italian. That sounds more Greek to me. So you, you tell me what we're talking about. <laughs> Basically, uh, percutaneous hydrotomy is a French technique I learned in France. Um, and it's, uh, it was originally designed for the treatment of chronic pain, like back pain, knee pain, shoulder, frozen shoulders, that kind of thing. Guilty. Guilty. Yep. I got all did it. a lot of pain. Yes. Yeah. We all I'll suffer listen. from pain. Okay. So, so it's a, it's a, and, and think it's as easy as this. Uh, percutaneous means through the skin. Hydrotamine means to add water. So what, we're doing it's a technique that stems from the technique of mesotherapy which you may have heard and that's just very small needles placed uh medicines placing under the skin basically um it, it involves the treatment of what's called oligotherapy so you use vitamins and minerals it involves an tumescent anesthesia like they do on plastic surgery so we all know all about that and it and it involves don't pretend we know i don't know what that means i, I know what Tumescent means, but yeah, it just means up up under the skin. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Up, up under the skin. So all all it is, it's a technique to place what we place is like physiologic salines, anti-inflammatories, some local anesthetics, minerals, vitamins, sometimes some corticosteroids if necessary, depending, you know, and some other medications. And then we put them in the soft tissue compartment. Say if you have a knee pain or back pain, we'll use small ne mesotherapy needles and we'll, we'll, we'll infuse a certain amount of this solution under the skin to act as a slow release depot. So it's just a slow release mechanism of, of a solution, you know, that, that, that is in proximity of the pain. Of, of where your injury is, of where the cells are pissed off, for example. Like, you know, if you got knee osteoarthritis, your, your cells called chondrocytes are not happy. They're making pain receptors and they're making inflammation. And, and so when you step a certain way, it hurts like a son of a bitch. And so, you know, so if you, if you imagine that's, that's all it is. It's nothing more difficult than that. And, and, and we use it for some other medications like rheumatoid arthritis, like methotrexates delivered like this sometimes. Sometimes monoclonal antibodies are delivered subcutaneously under the skin like this. Um, and and uh, right, even right in your back, in the backyard of Los Angeles, 
they're not there anymore, but UCLA, Roy Altman, when he was alive, he did a big study showing that just saline helped injuries. Like they used to think saline was just a placebo. You know, you could, it did nothing is what they thought. And, and in fact, he showed in many, many studies uh, and others have too, that it doesn't, you know, it, it actually has a healing effect. Um, the, the cells, and, and it actually can, you could even go back to cancer, chronic cells and cancer cells all have different levels of water inside their cell that are supposed, you know, not optimal, not, not, not consistent with what a healthy cell would have. So it, it you know, it kind of gets in the weeds, but it, it, in a sense, you know, you're, you, you're treating the cells in this, in this case. And, and I always try to, it's not a miracle. It's something you can add, you know, you can add to say like physical therapy, PRP shots, you know, you, right, you, so, take, uh, you know, that's what came to mind. So let, let me break in here. Yeah. PRP. We know that it works some amount of time. We don't know how many, you know, some people get good results from it, but other people, you mentioned just putting in saline solution and that works, but we know that dry pricking in a lot of cases works also as well works. as PRP, yep. right? Yep. Uh, so, all right, so I'm a guy that's in a great amount of pain. Uh, just to give you my, my short resume, um, I played football through college. I broke everything. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, by the time I was uh, in my late 20s, I had a mountain bike contract and I rode mountain bikes professionally for a short period. I was an ultra cyclist for the better part of 15 or 20 years. I've tried to fuck up my body every which way you could and still be upright. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'll give you my two main, my right shoulder has been completely replaced. And I had uh -huh. the famous ream and run surgery done on that by the guy who invented it. Uh, Dr. Um, Matson up in, uh, at UW in okay. uh, Washington, uh, very controversial surgery at the time, but I'm a guy who could not shake your hand with my right hand because I was frozen to the side. I was in pain from the time I was 35, which made mountain biking very difficult, made everything difficult. Yep. Um, now I can do pull-ups. I'm 62 and I can, I can get in that pull-up bar right behind you and wrap off 15 controlled pull-ups right now. And they would say, wow. how are you doing that? Right. That's awesome. I'm yeah. lifting weights again. I'm doing everything. So, all right. So that's fine. But I have two areas where I'm in pain all the time. Lower back, ta-da, just like everyone else. Yeah. And my neck. And what happened was just one day my neck started hurting really badly. Like instead of just kind of hurting, like lockdown hurt. So went to a neurosurgeon. They did MRIs. They did everything. And they said, okay. You have bone on bone on three of your vertebrae, and obviously there's a nerve pinching between one of those three, and you're going to be in pain. Yep. How can we fix this, Doc? We can go in and we can we can add, we can insert these little things to these rods to make space. Yep. Yeah, we can make space, and then you okay. I don't want you that close to my my spinal cord. I'm good, right? So they said, okay, we can send you to a pain management guy. And yeah. I said, okay. So I went to this guy and I said, listen, I'm here because they told me there's some exercises or something you can show me. And he goes, yeah, no, we really treat people like you with medication. I was like, so what kind? So he's offering me like class three narcotics. It's like, well, I'm oh. supposed to walk on fucking high and complicated. <laughs> I, I'm not going to take this stuff. Yeah. Goes, well, there's nothing else you can do. I came home, I believe in being super hydrated to help all of these ailments. Yep. I take my own electrolyte that my company, Pure Vitamin Club, makes. I take it winter and summer. I take it all the time. And if you notice, I keep 40 ounces of water next to me all the time, right? That helps. I also created a number of neck exercises, working everything from the sternocleomastoid in the front to every muscle around and in the back and every which way using weights and pulleys and, and stretchy bands and harnesses and everything else. I virtually pulled myself out of a nosedive by wow. moving my neck every day, by drinking a lot of water, by taking a lot of electrolytes. 
but it's not perfect. No, it's not even close to perfect. My question is, is there a way to do even better? Not only for my neck, but for my lower back, which is a, a whole different amount of pain. Yep, there. So yeah, yeah, I like to start off with when I talk about these things, it's it's all about keeping energy in motion. If you ever read the Nobel laureate, Albert uh, sent Georgi, he was a Hungarian physiologist. And I he have said, not. yeah, he's uh, he's one of those geniuses like Einstein, just in the field of medicine and physiology. And he said that, no, the, in every culture before ours, human healing has always taken place with the movement of energy. Okay. So healing always involves moving energy. If you can, if you, if you're unable to move energy, then healing is never going to be optimal. So I always keep that in mind. You know, when I'm thinking about the healing process for anything I do, really. So when you think about something like percutaneous hydrotomy or, or, or anything, a steroid shot or, you know, these these fancy um, nerve blocks they do, it's it's about keeping you moving. It's about keeping you with the ability to be able to do your therapy, to be able to, say, do your back exercises or, or you know, or, or just exercise in general, just and because where people get stuck in a rut, they they hurt so bad they can't move. Right. And so one thing one thing that I've seen across the board, and you know the, <clears throat> and some people you've had on this podcast, I've treated their loved ones, and same thing. They've had back pain, and I treated their back. So basically, it involves putting a large amount of fluid in the back with the mesotherapy needles. Usually, I have like eight ports, and I'll put local anesthetics. What does that do? Local anesthetics breaks the pain cycle. What does the water do? The water is able to diffuse down into the cells that are pissed off and even hydrate. Um, you know, some of it is taken up by the cells, we'll just say. You know, minerals. You know, the, the cells need energy. They need cofactors like selenium, magnesium, zinc. They need vitamins. You add in amino acids. You know, all those help the cells. You also add in anti-inflammatories like Toradol. Um, in case people who have like nerve involvement, you might add a little bit of Decadron, which is a steroid, but you use a like a tenth of the dose than say you would get in a pain management shot. And then you can use some other things like uh, pentoxifilin and some other medications that I won't get into the weeds about. But what I can what I can tell you is each person that not everybody and it again, it's not a miracle. But when most people do this treatment, they feel like they have better function. They bet they can move better, and their pain is decreased somewhat. To so, you know, and some some people have great great responses, and some people have just okay responses. And it just depends on you know where your pathology is. Are you bone on bone, or you know what what's going on? And and I can it's it's pretty neat to see. And then. So, so the fact that you can keep somebody exercising and moving is the key. And, and I think that's something what percutaneous hydrotomy um, and other modalities um, help with. And that's, that's basically the crux of it. You know, it's not more complicated than that. Yeah, you look, I, I get on my floor every day. I know this sounds weird every day. Yes, I keep no, a yoga mat on yeah. my floor because I still work my shoulder because I, <clears throat> I want to wake up in the morning and get some synovial fluid moving right away. Yep. Before breakfast, the shoulders worked on. I do some stretching. I try to release my lower back a little bit. I roll on the pad and I, you know, and then I do some stretches. I've been, I don't Do you know Stephen Hussey at all? He, you know, Dr. Yep. Stephen Hussey. Yeah, actually, actually I had contact with him while I was writing the book because, uh, you know, I, I kind of go in there about, you know, what he's big on the heart and, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the structured water. And I actually had contact with him and Gerald Pollack while writing this, while writing my book. Well, <laughs> all right. So, you know, Stephen, right. And I've been at parties, yep. I, yep. I, you know, like they, they'll have parties for, you know, people that you know, we're all speaking the next day, there'll be like a speaker's party at someone's house. I've been at someone's house and Stephen, will go, uh, yeah, just get in that chaise lounge right there. And he'll, like manipulate my neck and get it, it sounds like you know it's a, he goes oh yeah and he does it it's more cracks than you've ever heard right yeah 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 and i get 
I get up and then he'll say, uh, oh, wait, let me do your lower back and, you know, just pop it and crack it and do all this stuff. While I'm sitting there having a drink, he'll just, just lay here. But, yeah. Okay. I went to a chiropractor here and this guy couldn't do anything. So they're not all equal, right? No. When they kind of move you around. And I'm trying to explain to the chiropractor, oh, you're tight. It's like, listen, I just did 90 minutes of stretching in my gym before I walked in here. I should be nice and loose. I've even tried things like an hour on my bike. You can't yeah. be, the only thing I'll do is get off the bike, dry off, run to his office. You can't be any more warm than that. Oh, right. you're tight. And I'm like sitting there going, you're not getting it. I know a guy that can, at a cocktail party, that can, you know, open me up, and you're not doing it here. I need someone who can work with me, and I'm wondering if this is not a good thing for me to do. Where are you located, by the way? Uh, I'm actually, in, I'm a, I have two, two places I practice right now in uh, Florida and uh, also in Las Vegas. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, where would I be? What, what part of Florida? I'm trying to figure out. It's like Daytona area, the East Coast there by Cape Canaveral, you know, where Elon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I got, a nephew, the rockets. I got a nephew in Destin. That's that's probably four or five hours away, I'm guessing. Uh, we, we can, we'll work it out, man. Uh, I, I'm willing to try something because, you know, I'm always in peril and I work out every single day. You talk, you're looking at a guy that does not miss a day. Right. Even through cancer, you know, I was much slower, but I was getting on a bike or rowing yeah. machine or something every day. I don't want to ever stop. Right. I'm like, yeah. Well, just so you know, I was a, I'm, I, I'm a former Cat One cyclist and I've raced against like Floyd Landis and those guys in the uh, oh, wow. California pro scene. So when you, when you, when you bring up cycling, that's, uh, I'm right. Uh, we're, we're on the, we're on that same suffer page. I, same I know page. Uh, where were you? Where were you in California? I grew up, I was born in San Jose. I grew up in uh, Victorville, Apple Valley. I went to university at Victor Valley College and then off to UC Davis. And that's where I got into cycling. And, and it was like, you know, it's one of those things. I was a good runner. I did a two, two hour 30 marathon, you know, in yeah. college. And then, um, and then it got to, I, then I started cycling at UC Davis and quickly, I quickly got it. And then, and then, uh, the decision came like, well, should I go pro or, you know, like go on to that or go to medical school? And it was like, I thought for a second about going, doing the cycling thing. It was like, yeah, no. <laughs> going Davis to is school. one of the cycling capitals of the world. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's where I did. In my 30s, I built myself up, you know, from cap four, five, three, two, and then one. Yeah. And I raced the California State Championships. I raced, you know, the Gila the tour of the Gila, you yeah. know, and some of those, you know, some of those hard, that's where I, you know, would race against some of these pro guys. And, uh, yeah, I did. It was, uh, yeah. So the cycling is a really big part of my life. And I've been the team doctor actually for AG2R, uh, fly yeah. V Australia. And, uh, I've done the tour of California five times. So yeah, so it's a, it's a big part of my, big part of my, uh, red, my repertoire, if you say. Yeah, we, we could probably sit around and talk about cycling all day long. I, <laughs> I refuse to get on a bike anymore. I'm, I'm, I keep threatening to get on a gravel bike now because I'm so sick of it. Oh, my gosh. I was yeah. thinking about getting a gravel yeah. bike and trying that. But, you know, you get old enough and it's like, eh, the spinner's good enough. But someone was asking me the other night, it's like, oh, you've ever been on rollers? It's like, yeah, at one time we only had rollers. Right. You, know, it's like, you know, it's like they don't realize what we've been through with cycling. But yeah, um, Davis was a great area. Um, one of one of the first guys to ever ride in the tour was from that area. Uh, yep. Jonathan. Oh, you mean uh, Steve and. Um, yeah, you're not talking Vodders. Um, no, not, not Jonathan Vodders, but uh, Jonathan. He ended up getting into some kind of trouble with you know, some child or something, some weird thing, but. Oh, I know who you're talking his, about. His yeah, name was Jonathan, yeah. right? Jonathan, he was like the first American, even before, um, you know, uh, what's his name went? Uh, Lamont. Right. Um, you're talking uh, Jock Boyer. 
Jacques, yeah, yeah, Boyer, yeah, I kept it, Jacques Voir. And by the way, he was in one of the early, you know, he came back from Europe to be in the race across America, the Ram. Yep. And uh, he got beat by Pete Pensiers, and he said, this is not a bike race, it's a, it's a sleep deprivation contest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which is what it was. I've I've uh, crewed for my buddy and Ram. We we all yep, yep. God, we were so deep in all the the ultra stuff at one point. But right, yeah, right. Uh, oh, uh, but yeah, uh, Jacques was from that area too. And people forget he's probably one of the first Americans to go over to Europe. Yeah, which and paved the way for you know Le Mans and uh, the other guy who won the, the the he didn't win the tour of Italy, but he won a stage. On a snowy day in June, uh, Andy Hampton. Yeah, Hampton. Yeah, was another early American, and then yep. uh, that led the way for uh, Lamont, and then eventually Lance Armstrong. Yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah that, and you got to remember Jacques Boyer. He actually he actually led the um, the uh, African. You know, he he actually supported some African teams and brought some Africans over from. Tour from Rwanda, yeah, that, that wound up being pro and such, yeah. And we finally had uh, an African win a stage of the tour this year, and he ended up winning two and three stages. Yeah, two or three, and the green jersey, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, this guy just came out there. It was like, wait a minute, we have a brand new sprinter on the scene. Yeah, and uh, that guy was awesome. Yeah, I, I don't even keep up with the tour that much, but I watched. I guess I watched a dozens, maybe a half dozen stages. Right, right. No, it's a, it's a, I've worked with Roman Bardet. I've worked with, you know, a lot oh, wow. of those guys. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I was at AG2R and such, and it's, uh, yeah, no, as you know, they just, they just have different, they're just different species, different animals. If so, you don't mind me asking, how old are you? What's your age? 55. Do you know, uh, 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 Chris Robinson, Robinson's wheel works. He, uh -huh. He's up there somewhere. He's yep. got a bike shop. He's building wheels and selling bikes and everything. Yeah, else. yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. He yeah. he was around that, all of that. He was around the pro circuit for a while. So I figured, oh, you guys probably know each other. Oh yeah. But Jonathan, yeah. I don't want to keep you. Very, I, I, you you got to promise to come back. This has been. <laughs> we can, yeah, we could keep going because, like, yeah, I'm still. You know, I got plenty of stories on how I use the ketogenic diet and bike racing. Um, you know, I'd use it. You know, I think, you know, the metabolic advantages, um, you know, and then, yeah, we could go on, you know, like sports injuries for this, you know, for my percutaneous hydrotomy. Um, can, can, can I have you back pretty quickly? I, you know, like literally, I have to go to California this week to take care of something, but I'll be back yeah. next week. Can I bring you back on for a part two? You just you just let me know, and I, I'm more than happy to come back. Well, as soon as we, we cut the mics off, we're going to set up a part two here because I would love to get into the ketogenic diet and going long distance because it's one of the things I – people ask me about it. It's like, oh, I can't keep up in the whole thing. And I, I mean, my friend Tim Noakes just proved that you could get someone deep into zone three and still not use sugar. Yep. Some people are better than others. I just helped an ex-motocross guy named John michelle Bale uh, who won several championships and he did the race across France and I, oh, wow. and, we, and we coached him and he did the whole thing, uh, pure ketogenic. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the Dakar you, you mean on the motorcycle no. or running? No, no. He did the race across France on a bicycle. On a bicycle. Yep. And he but was completely across. So I was wondering. He was a former motocross racer. Okay. So he was world, you know, he's world champion, all this. And now he's, you know, he's our age, my age. Um, and his thing now is long distance, kind of like doing the Ram, you know, and they have a French race called the race across France. And yeah. And I mean, doing it in a ketogenic state was ideal for what he was. All right, so he all right, so we, Jonathan, we have a part two coming up. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> so hang on. Don't go anywhere. Um, okay. Let me say goodbye. Uh, by the way, Jonathan, hold your books up and tell people you, they're on Amazon. I haven't read them, folks, but they will be in the Vinny Book Club. It's the revolutionary, uh, the revolutionary ketogenic uh, ketamine, and also stopping pain. And then I wrote this book on marathon with Dr. Veronique Balat. Um, 
Science We've got a lot more to talk. We got so much more to talk about. All of that is on Amazon. I will have um, Debbie put them in the book club and you guys will be able to find them. But we will do a part two. Uh, just to let you know, Jonathan, I usually cut these things at about an hour, an hour and five minutes. And we're at an hour and 15 minutes here. And if I didn't have another podcast, I would do it right now and then yeah. just split it into two shows. But I have to go do another show. Uh, so... Uh, you know what to do with me. We have the new movie out, Dirty Keto. So go check that out. You can go to VinnyTartarese.com, click through the banner. When you watch Dirty Keto, and please rent it, buy it, do whatever you're going to do. But once you watch it, please rate it and review it. That's how people find the movies yep. and go on from there. So go do all of that. Um, I do have, I didn't have any music for Jonathan on the front end, but there is this song that Jonathan reminded me of. And it reminds me of my childhood because my dad's band used to play this song. And it's also by Jonathan Edwards. So on behalf of <laughs> my Jonathan Edwards, put life into living and do it with this Jonathan Ed uh, Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> 